Turner. That dread word, unelectable, was for years the property of the Labour Party. Then came Tony Blair. Now the label of unelectability is hung around the neck of the Tories. Languishing in the polls, still riven by internal conflict, William Hague still has a job to do before getting himself into number 10. And he began the job today with his first reshuffle. It was not as radical as some had predicted. Cecil Parkinson, Michael Howard and Norman Fowler are still there. But he did manage to bring in some fresh blood and move other pieces around. Tomorrow's front pages suggest that this is both rightwards lurch and a step backwards. But will it do the party any good? Matthew Paris, former Tory MP, now Times columnist. Are the Tories more electable this evening than they were this morning? No. Um, they were electable this morning and they remain electable. It's a slow process towards electability. They're far from it still. It'll take four years at the very least and perhaps eight years. It's a steady progress. Uh, the government are gradually coming unstuck, but that's slow. Uh, William Hague is taking decisions step by step. This has been another useful change, I think, in his team. No big news, no big change. Helpful, sensible, uh, one more step on the way, that's all. OK, take us through the headlines of the day's proceedings. <coughs> well, I haven't seen tomorrow morning's headlines yet. If, if these, are, these changes are seen as being a huge step to the right, no, they aren't. If they're seen as a step to the left, no, they aren't. What are they, then? If they're seen as a, a failure to clear away dead wood, no, they aren't, because some dead wood is cleared away. If they're seen as a complete sweeping away of the old team, no, they aren't, because much of the old team remains. It's, it's a pretty progressive evolutionary change. I think a sensible, rather cautious one. Theresa May, um, I suppose we should congratulate you, first of all, for becoming a French bench uh, spokesperson. Yes. Uh, how much do you know about education, which is the job you've been given, mm -hmm. and what is Mr Haig trying to do? Well, I think one of the reasons I've been asked to go on to the education team is because I'm actually a former chairman of a local education authority. So I've actually had some experience in education. And I think that's one of the interesting things in this uh, reshuffle is that a number of people have been put into places where they do actually have expertise and experience. I think what William has been trying to do is, as Matthew has said, he's been taking some cautious and sensible steps to be uh, towards uh, starting the party, looking forward to the future. Uh, he's put into place a very balanced team of people. Uh, he's got both new faces and experience in there. I almost feel there's nothing wrong with the Tory party at the moment. Emma Nicholson, Norman Fowler, Cecil Parkinson, Michael Howard, a revitalised Tory party. Why did we have a, sh a, a, a reshuffle in the first place then? Well, I think the Times has got it right. Matthew's paper in its leading headline on the front page says, Haig moves the party to the right. And as his sister paper, The Sun, says in the leader writer in the centre page, it says, into the shadows. And I think that's probably exactly what it's all about. Haig is a further right-wing move, and he has, in fact, put in as his deputy, the first deputy leader I think the party's had since uh, Willie, ha Willie Whitelaw, mm -hmm. William Haig put in Peter Lilly and since 1983 and 1984 Peter Lilly's comments on Europe are profoundly anti-European. Keep all of our money at home, don't let any of it go out anywhere uh, is, is his sort of line, a sort of little ingleta par excellence. So it is a definite shift and it's no good pretending that nothing has happened. John Hanneman, is the Peter Lilly move a promotion or a demotion? Well, I think it's actually, in many respects, a, a very sensible move because he's a thoughtful and reflective person and what the Tory party desperately needs at the moment is someone who's actually thoughtful and reflective, trying to come up with some ideas. That is what they say conspicuously lack. But you know, in a sense, I'm not quite sure what, you know, what we're making a fuss about because mm. as the, um, the six o'clock news um, scheme things this evening, I think they got it basically right. There are three major reshuffles today. Um, one of them was the England football team, one of them was the Spice Girls, <laughs> and the third, in, as it was presented in the evening news this evening, and by far the least significant, so far as the British public is concerned, uh, is what happened to the Tory cabinet. But that, does that tell us more about the state of the Tory party? I'm afraid it does, actually. And it also tells us, I think, something quite significant about public perceptions of the Tory party, and that is that they are old hat. And I must say, when I heard on the, um, the Today programme this morning that the, the most exciting um, thought tipped for the changes today was that um, Miss Widdicombe was going to move uh, to a front bench position. I thought that summed up everything. The idea that you know, the promotion of Miss Widdicombe might somehow be a bold, novel and exciting move for the Tory party. Um, well, well, more about Miss um, Widdicombe in a well, second, but, <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm interested in the hmm. Peter Lilly appointment. I, is that, uh, is that, a, is that a, a significant appointment, Matthew Paris? No, Emma's uh, just got that plane wrong. I'm afraid it's a demotion for Peter Lilly, and I'm sorry, because mm. um, uh, like John, I rather admire Peter Lilly, but I'm afraid deputy leader of the party has never been a job 
that meant anything at all. It's what Mrs. Thatcher did. But he is head of policy, isn't he? He is head of policy. So what? So what? Head of policy means so very little. A front bench shadow appointment is the important one. Uh, I hope uh, that, that Peter Lilly will still be important in terms of policy, mm. but I, I thought that as shadow chancellor, that probably was his most important hour, and I, I'm sorry that he's not still shadow chancellor. On the other hand, Francis Maud's pretty bright, though certainly not to the left of of, uh, of Peter Lilly, Emma, I, I don't think this can be seen as a move to the right in any sense. Fr fr uh, yeah, Theresa, just w th this whole thing about Peter Lilly, I mean, Francis Maud is coming. Is, is Francis Maud a, a, a more significant appointment than Peter Lilly in that particular position? Well, I'd like to take issue with what Matthew said about, uh, about Peter Lilly's appointment, because it is actually an extremely important appointment. I hope so. uh, well, it is important, and it's important for this reason, which <coughs> is that he is going to be heading the policy review that the party is, is uh, going to be undertaking, uh, and will be starting and uh, that is going to be an extremely important policy right. review for the party actually looking at uh, the policies that we need to take forward into the next election based on basic conservative principles and values right. but rethinking on the details of policy I think it's extremely important and I'm very pleased that we have somebody of Peter's caliber actually leading that particular move in the party and I'm, I'm looking forward to the work that he's going to be doing but does John Maples move mean that they're going to give defense a high priority well, I think defence is, is important to have a high priority. I mean, I think we've seen some extremely interesting moves on the, uh, the front bench uh, team today uh, in terms of the areas that are going to be important. And Did I think what you're going to be seeing mm. now from the uh, Conservative opposition across the board is no, the sort of three, three, holding the government to account, which is what our okay. task three, is. I'm going to have to doing. ask you, can you give us some yeah. examples? I mean, you're going to have to do that. Can you give us some well, examples why this is going to be such a high priority position, the one that Maples now occupy? Well, defence is a particularly important issue at the moment because of the implications of the Strategic Defence Review. But, frankly, uh, but, Theresa, but if you can I just say? Can I just one. can I just say that? Please, I mean, it's ahead. not. I don't want to single John Maples out and say that is the most significant uh, uh, move that's taken place. The, what William has done is put together a balanced team of people, all of whom are, are now going to be able to take the party forward and do those two very important tasks, which is on the one hand to hold the government to account oh. and on the other hand to develop the thinking within the party uh, and to take us into the next election. And the policy review, and Peter Lilly is extremely important in that If you in that wanted context. someone to bang the drum on defence, if you wanted someone to blow the trumpet, uh, John Maples would not be your man. Uh, a highly intelligent, uh, rather sensible, rather low-key person. I, I think his move over to defence suggests that the Conservative Party are not going to be making very loud noises on defence for quite some time. Is it a, is it a rather a, a, a demotion for, for the boo-boo he made last week over the NHS? Uh, I don't think it's seen as a, as a boo-boo within the party. He, he got a lot of concentration on all sorts of retrenchment that is going on within the NHS. No, I think John Major is, uh, uh, John Maples is, is valued. Uh, and I think he'll be useful in defence, but I, I think it's a sign that the Tory party are not going to make a big noise about defence. I don't actually think the Conservative Party are going to make a big noise about anything, and I don't think they should. The sensible thing for the principal opposition to do at the moment, mm -hmm. at the height of a government's powers and its popularity, and, and uh, its popularity is very great, the sensible thing for an opposition to do is to lie low, stick together, sing from the same hymn sheet, uh, sound as though they all agreed with each other, and on the whole, wait for the government to stumble. Now, there are signs that the government are stumbling. They'll stumble more and more in the years ahead. And for the moment, just stay together and stay cool. And I think that's what William Hague has done in this, uh, this reshuffle. John mentioned Anne Widdicombe and uh, Deputy John Duncan. What about them? Sound appointments? Oh, poor Anne. Uh, I mean, Anne Widdicombe is brilliant. Uh, she's a real shin kicker. But the last time she came to public prominence was, uh, uh, so far as I remember, when as prisons minister, uh, she was having to justify the, the, the chaining of pregnant female prisoners to walls. Uh, to be shadow health spokesman straight after that is going to be difficult for her. She'll do a good job. Alan Duncan is also a terrier of the parliamentary right. He'll do a good job. This is a sign that on health, I think the Conservative Party are going to go on to the offensive. This is the end of the kind, caring, compassionate uh, Tory health image. This is going to be the shin-kicking Tory health image. And I think it'll probably be just what uh, Dobson needs. Theresa May, um, you've become a part, you're very much a part of this reshuffle. Ken Clark, Ian Taylor and Stephen Dorrell have been asked to, well, they've, they're not in it, they've, they've gone. What do you think that is all about? Why do you think that is? Why have they been quite happy to move on? 
Well, those have been uh, their decisions that they have uh, chosen, as you know, not to uh, take positions at various times, I mean, for various reasons, and Stephen Dorrell is the most recent of those. And I think what Stephen himself has said is that he wants to actually have some time to do some more thinking within the party, uh, rather than having the day-to-day -day, uh, detailed operations that you have to do as a shadow front bench spokesman. Emma Nicholson, it would seem that significant left-of-centre Tory MPs are quite happy to leave. What does that say to you? Well, the Conservative Party has moved to the right. Indeed, if you remember John Major in a Breakfast with Schwoss programme before the last general election, he made it absolutely plain. Quite apart from saying that anybody who voted Tory was a Conservative, as far as he was concerned, he said clearly that the Tory party is the party of the right, and we are the right-wing party, and that is who we are, and if you vote for us, you are right-wing. That was his clear indication, and he was the party leader and the Prime Minister at the time. That's very different from the people who continue saying, oh no, the Tory is central. The Tory party, like, Sam Brit uh, like Britain said last week, the Tory party has to appeal to the centre ground. That's old hat, that's gone, that's past. The Times uh, uh, headline today is a further move to the right. That's absolutely correct. Well, and by the uh, way, when we chatter you? about John Maple not talking, no wonder John Maple's not going to say anything. Andy McSmith of the Independent pinned the Tory front benches down on defence yesterday, only yesterday. One lot on the run hand, said Sir George Younger, then the spokesman a day or two ago, was saying uh, cut defence and the other one was saying the opposite, or vice versa. Two front bench spokesmen with no single hymn sheet. That's if, just if, a bad if you joke. See it as a move and to Whittingham, the right. of course, in health, this is going to be a really sick joke. Last time she really came to prominence was chaining pregnant women giving birth to beds. If you want to be on a waiting list now, Diane Kim, that, that's the safest place to uh, be. Uh, Don't Anne go Whittingham into is, a hospital. Is, You'll Anne be Anne chained is, to a bed. Not Strong words. And Whittingham, is, it's quite Whittingham true. is not a, a sick joke. And that, that's actually a, it a, is a, pretty, sick joke a pretty unhelpful way of describing an intelligent woman. May, may I, and a very I, good member of the House of Commons. And if you, if you, if you see this, this, Emma, if well, you see I, this as a move, if you I see this as a move, of prison, Emma, she shackled Emma, women, she, ha she, she, she allowed she women shackled, to be shackled oh, this is, this is in important. hospitals, and that is correct. And, it is utterly and, correct in December 1995. Look up the press cuttings. Let's give Matthew a chance to respond. Look up the press cuttings, it is true. Matthew, also, can Matthew have a chance to respond? Absolutely. But it is true that. Liberal Democrats often like to present themselves to the electorate as the reasonable ones, as the ones who, when the left are saying left-wing things and the right are saying right-wing things, try to be reasonable and sensible and fair. I said to, that and as a Conservative. Now, you just, let me, you just let me finish, Emma. I said it in Emma, December 1995 Emma, that Andrew Emma, just, let, him, let, just let me finish. finish. Correct. Liberal Democrats often like to see themselves as the reasonable ones who are fair to individuals and take a medium course between the left and the right. If you are fair to Anne Whittacombe now, if you are taking other than a strictly partisan line, you would see her as an intelligent person, sometimes partisan, sometimes right-wing, someone who, as prisons minister, had to take the rap for quite difficult decisions that you know and I know were Michael Howard's decisions, not her, hers. And you would give her the benefit, I think, perhaps, of a, of a wish that she would do well in this new job. Anne Whittacombe tries hard in Parliament. She works hard for the party. She's an intelligent person. I think she deserves our good wishes. None of those things Every, detract the, from the, the fact the that the press fact she was in charge of the press have had a lot of fun. Women yes, Emma, to bed Emma, when Emma, dying Emma. men were chained to life support. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Oh, yes, okay. Okay. Don't be ridiculous. Well, I think I think, I think we're going to have to move correct. on. We're, we're, we're here to talk about we're here to talk about the reshuffle and yes. the reshuffle we will do. John, I'm going to give you a chance in a minute, but I want to present this this question to you, John. Reshuffling is one part of party renewal. What should be next on Hayes' list? Well, uh, I think if Haig is really keen on um, renewing the Tory party, um, he will look for another leader. Th the main problem with the Conservative Party, and this is where I think th that uh, Westminster outsiders often lack a certain perspective, is that you know, so far as the great British public is concerned, you know, what is happening in, in the sort of junior ranks of the, of the shadow ministry is neither here nor there. It will obviously have an impact in the long term as um, uh, Matthew was saying, there is a sort of geological shift that takes place in governments or in oppositions over a long period. But the main problem is one of, op is of image. And uh, while I don't agree at all with what was being said about Anne Whittacombe, there is a problem that the same people, the recognizable mm. brand images that are going to be seen by the British public of Whittacombe, of Michael Howard, of Cecil Parkinson, God help us, still as chairman, these are the old Tory guard. They are a discredited lot in the eyes of not only of the general British public, but also of many Tory voters. Tracy, the theme coming through here, mm. that the profile is waning. This matters. How can you actually get a better perception across to the British public? 
Well, that takes a, a, a variety of things, and this is one of the steps that uh, the party is taking. Uh, and I actually challenge this concept that suddenly everybody is just old hat and always has been old hat and, and is just still there. Uh, uh, because see, there, are, the there are faces that have... I don't that think that the, the Tory party hierarchy has yet taken on board just how seismic the shift was, that the great legacy of Mrs Thatcher was to reconstruct the Labour Party and to leave the Tory party. Yes, but I think they have, and, and mm -hmm. th what has happened, this is... This and they have not begun no, to sorry. understand what yeah. the implications of that the, are. The step that we've seen today in terms of the reshuffle is one step in a, in a process, and it's exactly yes. as Matthew described it earlier on. And the first stage in that process uh, was actually, if you like, the first stage was re-electing uh, electing a new leader, which happened last uh, summer when John Major stepped down. Uh, the next stage uh, was actually the changes that have taken place within the Conservative Party. Now, those don't make big headlines, and understandably so, because they, they don't impact on individuals individual members of the public. But in terms of the party uh, and the party organisation and positioning the party, they are extremely important. Well, and can I just, because I think <coughs> it's important to make the point that William Hague has changed the Conservative Party internally more in eight months than the Labour Party did in 18 years. That might be correct, but there's a perception that the Tory party doesn't matter. Now, you've been elected a front debate spokesperson. Will you matter for these next four years? Are you going to make a difference? And how? Well, what we have to do, what matters is not in the sense who has been elected, but uh, has been uh, selected to go on the front bench, but what they actually do when we're on mm -hmm. the front bench. And uh, we will be making sure, certainly I'll be doing my best to make sure that, that uh, I and Matt are in the brief, together with the rest of the team on the education brief. Of course. And, and Ter Theresa will, will do her best. Everyone will do their best. But for the next year or two, I don't think the Conservative Party will matter very much. All eyes are on the government. Until the government begins to stumble, the Tories are not going to matter. The changes William Hague has to make must be incremental. He knows but he must get rid of the old guard. He is getting rid of the old guard. This reshuffle represents the first and a major step in getting rid of the, the old guard. You know, out goes Stephen Dorrell, out goes Brian Mawinney. The next ones will come next. It'll be a slow process. It's a, it's a very slow Job. process if, it, if okay. it's only two a year. It's only one year. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think there's, there's a, a broader um, problem here, and, and that is that the, the nature of the leadership at the moment um, is failing to take heed of the fact that you know, what has happened is that the television revolution and the, the way in which image has become so central to the conduct of politics. We may not like it, and this is a very sort of reasoned and intelligent discussion. No, it isn't. Um, <coughs> well, that's part of it, really, is, actually. Um, <laughs> go on, John. Um, <laughs> uh, well, no, no, I don't want to go back to that. Please, let's not re yeah, reopen that. It's the past, um, but it was correct. Yeah, okay, right. Yes, but the, the key thing is that... You know, do these incremental changes amount to a strategy which cumulatively is heading in a direction which is plausibly uh, going to be victorious? And it seems yes. to me that those incremental can, changes are not. I, I did promise Tracer yeah. uh, yeah. 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 to respond well, to this. Yes, can I just, because I think there are, two, there are two points that I would raise about this issue about whether we matter, and indeed it relates to the point that John's just made about whether these incremental changes will have the impact uh, that certainly I think that they, uh, they will have. And there are two signs that, that, that we are beginning to matter and that that change is already taking place. One of the signs is the way in which we have been winning uh, council elections and council by-elections and have now overtaken the Liberal Democrats again to become the second party in local government. And we will and we will and we will and we will progress even further on that. And the second element is the way in which the correct. membership of the party is now starting yeah. to increase. Emma, you're saying this is not correct. Yes. Why? This isn't correct. The Conservatives are the third party in local government. But there is a more important point, I think, even than that to make, which is that it isn't the duty of the opposition to see quietly. Matthew Paris seems to think that the best thing the Tories can do, well maybe it is the best thing they can do, is fade away into the shadows as the sun determines that they should do well, today. What actually the matters for the are. opposition is to challenge what the government is doing, and that in fact is what the Liberal Democrats are doing. Absolutely not. Can I just ask give you an example? I've been leading a bill in the House of Lords for the Liberal Democrats, and I've been working with the government, and we've got nine major amendments through in the data protection legislation which is personal privacy, which is looking after people with big government power, with big uh, power from all around the globe on information and privacy. And that's not what well, the talk opposition about, has well, been I mean, You talk about do. constructive opposition. Why are you only working with the Labour Party, not the Tories? Because the Tory amendments, in fact, were not very good. The Tory took their amendments, put them down practically the night before. Six to seven amendments couldn't find their places on the pieces of paper and didn't know what they were saying. Emma, Where they supported my amendment, I did work Emma, with Emma, look them, me in the and eye. And I was very pleased about that. Emma, they look me. They supported me. Is this, look, is this look me in the eye and yes. tell me that Paddy Ashdown is going to let you make serious trouble 
for the Labour Party in the House of Lords. I'm sure that's more than possible. It's not and true, if, Emma, and you know it. <laughs> Why? I know Why? that it is true. I know that it's not true. Sorry. I'm 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 sorry. i am sorry i am sorry i am sorry i am sorry i am and Paddy will keep the Liberal, Liberal Democrats on board. There will be no serious trouble for the government from Liberal democracy. And uh, right. prove me wrong, Emma. Okay, John, you, we've said here, uh, uh, Matthew's mentioned Tony Blair, let's, let's focus on the leaders. Can William Hague take on effectively Tony Blair? Well, William Hague is uh, an extremely effective parliamentary performer, and uh, for those who take question time seriously, which is, I suppose, MPs take question time seriously, um, it, it's reassuring uh, to Conservative MPs that he performs so admirably. Of course, the, the, the real fact of it is that question time is an absolute irrelevancy. And the fact that he is articulate and that he is combative and uh, he scores points very effectively off Tony Blair is neither here nor there. What matters is the image people see of the leader. Now, this is, is not a particularly um, you know, high-minded line to take, of course, but you know, that is the world in which we live. And I think that the days when the British public will elect um, a balding 30-year-old uh, or balding 40-year-old as uh, Prime Minister, disgraceful though that may be, are long since gone. You know, we live in a deeply baldest society. No, 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 no. You saw when... when, when Theresa, I, I honestly don't I mean, think is that, people is that are so true? image conscious yeah. that it matters whether people have that well, amount of go It's on. the brains <laughs> behind it that count, and the fact of the matter is that, that William Hague oh, is an invisible man. Oh, William Hague really is an invisible man. Look at the opinion polls. They don't have anything to do with who's bald or not. That's a ridiculous comment. Keith Joseph would have been leader of the Conservative Party. Here. The Brains passion be... for politics and for people that a real political leader needs. But well, he seems to have kept a party that was splintering very, very badly. He's kept it together. It's difficult to see yet quite what the results of William Hague's leadership will be. And there I fully agree with Matthew. That's why they're better. Lie low, say nothing, and fade away. Interesting. John, I mean... <laughs> You were the supporter of John Redwood. And this is interesting. That I mean, Redwood seems to have been talking about image, but Redwood seems to have moved into the background, and uh, you supported him for the leadership. He couldn't have done any better than Hay, could he? I don't think he could, actually. Um, I think he's probably more intelligent than Haig, but I think that he's equally unsellable. And I think that is the problem with the Conservative Party at the moment. In so far as they did have someone um, in sellable in media terms, it was Clark. But of course, his views on Europe I find deeply poisonous. But just rather shatter your view of, of image, where you, you, you render Haig as someone as, as born, doesn't have the perceptions and the charisma, but maybe. But Redwood is equally unelectable, isn't he? I know, it's, it's a deeply depressing state of affairs. I don't think well, of myself as a great idealist, but why are you all talking just about image and about baldness and about television and about how people seem and about what their ratings and the opinion polls are at the moment? Because this appears not, to be what matters. It, well, it, it's always what matters at the moment. It's always ratings what matters at the hour. But over the long term, substance matters. Argument matters. And if Tony Blair makes a good fist of this, if he, stick, if he sticks to his course, keeps things together, if the country stays on keel, if the economy improves, then nothing that the Conservatives do and no leader whom they produce and no possible uh, combination in a shadow cabinet will make any difference. But if the Labour Party stumble, and I believe they will, because I think their philosophical roots are very shallow, then we will look again with interest at the Conservative Party, and it's just a matter of patience. Theresa, what are the issues? What issues do you think the Tory parties can make great capital <coughs> on and perhaps start to bring themselves back into mainstream politics? Well, they are in, in mainstream politics. I'm talking about being electable. Well, I think there are a number of issues that, that, uh, on which that will become clear over the next few months. And I think there are a number of issues that we have already uh, appealed to people on and been fighting very good campaigns on. And just a couple of examples of those that we have succeeded very well on in recent months are the campaign against the Chancellor's initial proposals uh, on retrospective uh, tax changes on Peps and Tessas and the campaign on Greenbelt and the Countryside, both extremely important campaigns to people that they affected. Well, I, I and they have actually they matter to people. The problem. 
that you should come up with campaigns on PEPs and TESSES as one of the great you know, signal contributions of the Tory opposition over the last six months. You know, we've had one of the major changes to the British Constitution since the 18th century in the last two years. The Conservatives have had absolutely nothing significant well, that to is, say that about is the absolutely question. wrong to say to say that because the and Conservative that, Party have been talking about constitutional change. We have been opposing various aspects of constitutional change that the government has oh, been putting off. through. It yes, is we hopelessly muddled and muddied from beginning you, to you, end. You, Even you, on the House of Lords well, they can't get a coherent line. We well, did oppose devolution and now it's there, isn't yes. it? Well, it is there, yes. I mean, we opposed it and the government has put it into place and we will have to consider uh, our uh, stance when we uh, see the Scottish Parliament and the Welsh Assembly in place. I think but we, we certainly brought forward the arguments against the Scottish Parliament and against the Welsh Assembly. Well, I think a very big um, challenge for the Conservative Party and something it's going to have to decide fairly soon is how to deal with English nationalism. Uh, I noticed Francis Maud in almost, well, it must be his last outing as culture mm. uh, shadow secretary of state this afternoon complaining about the way Scottish ministers were abolishing uh, the uh, English Tourist Board. As the Scottish it's Parliament gets stronger, uh, as, waste of money. As, um, as the Scottish Parliament gets stronger, as the role of Scottish MPs in English affairs becomes more and more questionable when we don't have a Parliament of our own in England, the call within English conservatism for what you might call an English Tory party rather than a British Tory party will become very strong. But I must ask We had that from 1623 mm. until 1968. We had Scottish peers in our parliament. They were mm. elected from Scotland and nobody complained. Well, as this Pardon me, there were no Scottish peers now. in 1623. But this, but this, is, a, this is a very yes, interesting burning well. issue. I mean, do, 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 do the Tory party need to find a new ideology and is that based in English nationalism. I think that uh, I entirely agree with I Matthew. I should think about I, it. My, my sense is that they will have no alternative but mm. to, to root their ideology in English nationalism. Um, and I think that Haig has, has not begun to understand this. Certainly, the appointment of a future Scottish Marquess as uh, the chairman of the Conservative Party as of October strikes me as a curious touch. Um, but I think Matthew is entirely right. The, the reaction against Scotland, when it becomes apparent to what extent England is subsidising Scotland, and indeed has continued to subsidise Northern Ireland, um, will inevitably produce a reaction. Mm. Could we withstand that? I seldom heard such a rationale for what would turn into racism. What do we mean by English nationalism? We mean this famous cricket test of 1939 well, and Norman Tebbit. We don't mean multicultural, multi-ethnic, vibrant, enthusiastic, cool or warm Britain. I haven't the faintest idea, but that's not the England, the Scotland, the Wales, and the Northern Ireland or era that I know and love. Are you that is Scottish my right. Is it, is, Theresa, I, please. Yes, yes, I think I, it's important that you respond thank here you, as I, a person <laughs> of the party. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe, I don't agree with John's analysis. I don't think that the party will be turning to English nationalism. I do agree with, with Matthew in the sense that I think there is uh, a concern there about a reaction among the British people, the English people, mm. to what they are seeing in terms what of Scotland and the amount, of money, and the amount of money that is going you know, into wh Scotland. Why should, there, why should there be a double Scottish representation? You know, what well, is the answer to that? Well, that is, a, that is again, that is why... in the 1920s, which put that large sums of money into Scotland because Scotland was so poor then. And the whole object has been to try to lift the standard of living in Scotland, which always in the poorest corner of England and Scotland has yes, been but that Scotland. Was that was the, the last word, ladies and gentlemen, Baroness Nicholson has the last word, I'm afraid. That's it for tonight. Just